the text and we'll start reading. Sunki has started recording, so we can start. <laughs> the core of the teaching. So, so shall we start? I Tarika has to get everybody has to get Archana Di Bonjour. Good morning. Bonjour. Yes, yes. Okay, so it's not a very big para. We'll have to read it. Duty. Duty is a very interesting thing. We'll have to see what it is. Okay. So if everybody is ready, I start reading. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm reading the para. Okay. I'm reading each sentence. We must remember that duty is an idea which in practice rests upon social conceptions. There is nothing of called duty in the spiritual consciousness because in the spiritual consciousness you are completely in the hands of the divine and not society. So this is a very important thing that all duties fail in the spiritual plane. Okay? When you are a family member, okay, you have a duty to your family. It is also not at all very uncommon for some children when their parents are not very well to do. When the elder boy or girl has younger children in the younger brothers and sisters, they sacrifice their own um, development and start earning so that the others can also uh, go to school. So that's a duty, it's a family duty. Okay, Your children, your mother and father tell you to help in the kitchen, you do that, it's a duty. You're told to go and get things in the market, you do that, it's your duty, family duty. The parents also have a duty to the children, the children have a duty to the parents. Then, do you have a duty at a slightly higher level? Yes, you have a duty for, you're responsible for your community. When the community decides something, which is desirable, then you have to do it. Then again, you have a duty to the nation. But as soon as you go beyond the nation to these divine, there is no duty at all. There is nothing binding you down. Why? Because the divine will tell you what to do and what not to do. There is no duty. He will tell you what to do and what not to do. So this is the whole idea. Okay? So we must remember that duty is an idea which in practice rests upon social conventions. These are all social conventions, not at all anything spiritual. We may extend the term beyond its proper connotation and talk of our duty to ourselves, or we may, if we like, say in a transcendent sense that it was Buddha's duty to abandon all. <laughs> so he is changing the meaning of the word duty. Okay, It depends on what your fate is telling you to do and what your soul is telling you to do. So if he has to abandon all, that becomes his duty. <laughs> so I'm saying in a transcendent sense, not in a social sense. And even that, it is the ascetic's duty to sit motionless in a cave. So I'm extending the meaning of the word duty. <clears throat> but this is obviously to play with words. <laughs> Naturally, because duty is a relative term and depends upon your relation to others. It is a father's duty as a father to nurture and educate his children. A lawyer's duty to do his best for his client, even if he knows him to be guilty. Now, that's interesting. It reminds me of Kodanda Raman and uh, he asked Sri Ramdo this question. Okay, And Sri Ramdo gave him the uh, example of um, Dorisame Ayengar. Okay. Ayengar, you may know, you may not know, because at that time he was there in the 30s. He was an extremely honest and very well respected lawyer. Okay. And he used to um, protect his clients very honestly. He never undertook wrong cases. So, Kodan Raman was a man who was in the ashram in the 1930s. There's a small book also on him. And he asked Sri Abdo, what should a lawyer, what should a lawyer do? Suppose you know your 
uh, your client to be guilty, what should you do? So, <laughs> Sri answered uh, to him, okay, that you have to do the best for your client. And you have to do the best, way. even if you know that he is guilty, okay, but you have to honestly defend him. And he gave the example of Dharasama Iyengar. Dharasama Iyengar was the gentleman who bought, he was a, he was a devotee of Mother and Sri Aurobindo. He bought the, uh, you know, the ashram main building has got four buildings it was. One by one they were all bought, okay. So, the first was the library building, that is the main gate and the uh, one on top and the reception room, that was one house. The other house was on the eastern side, the rosary gate. Nowadays, you people go in to the Samadhi from the rosary gate. So that is the other house. So the library house was bought by um, Rajangam. Rajangam was a young Tamilian medical student. And as soon as he passed his MBBS, he joined the ashram. In fact, he was asked to join because he was a devotee. In fact, the, I think Sri used the word yoke him. <laughs> Put the yoke on him and bring him here to Pondicherry. And Dharishema Yangar himself came to the ashram and it is he who bought the rosary house. The rosary house is the corner building opposite the school on the eastern side. Then the meditation hall and that was bought by Dara. Dara was a Muslim uh, devotee and that was bought by him. And the last one is what is called the prosperity house. So these four houses, okay, were all one by one. So Dorishami I mentioned because Dorishami <coughs> was a great devotee and Sri Aurobindo sent Dorishami when the, uh, the uh, Crips mission came to India in 1942 to convince India that we will give you freedom, but you please support us in the war. The Congress was not supporting the war. No? They were saying, we are ourselves fighting for our freedom. Why should we fight for your freedom? Who are your master? So the Congress party was not supporting. <coughs> the Indian army was another matter. The Indian army was not under the control of the Congress. <laughs> the Indian army was made up of people who needed a job. <laughs> That's why there were a million uh, soldiers the main uh, British army in the Second World War was Indian. Okay? And that is not acknowledged sufficiently by the West. They are not grateful enough for that. Anyway, so that question has come up now and we are insisting that that be recognized. They are beginning to recognize the contribution of India. So, Yorishami was sent to convince Gandhi and Nehru and Vallabhbhai Patel that the Crips mission offering uh, dominion status to India was good because dominion status means um, you will become free uh, but you will be linked to Britain. That was the idea and Sri accepted it. He saw it as a, a very good opportunity to avoid partition. Okay. So he said that but nobody listened to him. In fact, Gandhi, it's interesting the way Gandhi used it. He said it's a post dated check on a crashing bank. In other words, you are giving me a check which is dated one month or two months or one year afterwards and it may, and what is it? It is no value that check because the bank on which the British Empire is going to crumble after the Second World War. So what is the value of that check? We reject it. Gandhi's words were interesting. <laughs> one of those interesting words that he spoke. He said, I won't even touch it with a barge pole. <laughs> Even with a long pole, I will not touch it because it's a post-dated check on a crashing bank. <laughs> that was his words. But that was a big mistake because if he had accepted those words, they would have, he could have probably avoided partition. That is what is recognized nowadays. Even the Congress party now, they recognize that. So what happened? It led to a partition. No. So when he came back, Dharasami told, I tried to convince the Congress leaders, he told Sri Aurobindo, but they didn't listen. And Sri Aurobindo said in the evening talks, I knew it would fail. <laughs> he said, I knew it would fail. Then they asked him, if you knew that it would fail, why the hell did you accept it? Why did you do the trouble of sending Dharasami to them to convince them? You know what he answered? He said, 
I did a little bit of Nishkama Karva. Now that's interesting. That's what we are reading now here. Nishkama Karma, desireless action. Now, tell me, what value has Nishkama Karma when you know it's going to fail? Okay, it's an interesting question because every action that you do will have an effect. And that effect probably is going to come 75, 80 years afterwards is going to come. Partition will be cancelled. Okay. Every action that you do has got some value, even if it fails immediately. And that's what he did. It's a nish karma karma. <laughs> he knew it's going to fail and yet he did it. Okay. So that is a little aside. These little uh, incidents are interesting because some of you may not know these things. Okay, so I mentioned it. So he's saying now we are discussing duty. Okay, so duty is something that is a social uh, concept. It's not a spiritual concept. So if you stress it, then simply saying it is playing with words. It is uh, ascetic's duty to uh, go into the forest. It is Buddha's duty to leave his family. And you are playing with words. That's what I'm saying. It's a father's duty uh, as a father to nurture his children. The lawyer's duty to do his best. That's why I went in, into that uh, lawyer business. And even if he knows to be guilty and his defense to be a lie, okay, as soldiers to fight and shoot and to order, to order, even if he kills his own kin and country, it judges to send the guilty to prison and hang the murderer. And so long as these positions are accepted, sometimes they are not accepted in society. I'll give you an example. The duty remains clear, a practical matter of course, even when it is not a point of honor or affection or overrides the absolute religious and moral law. Now, let's have a look at all this. So, first of all, even if it is not a point of honor, okay, point of honor, question, if you are in the army, you have to do your duty. Okay, or affection in the family. Override the absolute or even your religion. If it is something that goes contrary to religion, you are in a position to not accept it if you are in a spiritual consciousness. Now, so long as these positions are accepted, that means you accept the social conditions. The duty remains clear. It's a practical matter. Of course, even when it is not a point of honor. Now, the question is, he's saying, if you accept these positions, today's world, you don't accept these positions. Because in the past, if their country says there is conscription, conscription means those countries who have got very small population, they train everybody, two years of military service, even compulsory for students, France, England, okay? I don't think it's there in America because they've got a lot of population. In fact, they use mercenaries for their army. They contract their two uh, professionals. So in, in most of the European countries have conscription. In India, we don't have conscription because we've got a huge number of people who apply for the army. So today in America, they accept that if your conscience is not allowing you to go to war, you have the right not to listen to your nation or your government. Okay, so, but if you are if, so saying, if you accept the position, then duty becomes a necessity. But if you don't accept the position, which is now being slowly acknowledged, then you have the, you have no duty. You don't need to listen to the society or to the nation or the government. Okay. But now, but what if the inner law, inner view is changed? Not social law anymore, but the spiritual law. If the lawyer is awakened to the absolute sinfulness of falsehood, the judge becomes convinced that a capital punishment is a crime against humanity. The man called upon to the battlefield feels like the conscientious objector of today. There you are. The conscientious objector of today that is being accepted now. Or as Tolstoy would feel, that in no circumstances is it permissible to take human life any more than to eat human flesh. If these things change, what happens? If you go to the spiritual level of consciousness, your social values will change. Then what happens? That's what I said, this question. So duty is not something 
that you need to follow if you are in the spiritual consciousness. But if you are not, it is better to follow the duty unless your conscience tells you not otherwise. It is obvious that here the moral law which is above all relative duties must prevail. So Srinivas is not even going to the spiritual level of consciousness, he is going to the moral law. So there is first of all the social law, then there is the moral law and then there is the spiritual law. So this question he has dealt with in the synthesis, the standards of conduct. According to him, there are four standards of conduct which are valid. The first one is when you are not developed enough, you have the right to develop yourself fully. That means you are in the ego and you have motives and you have to develop yourself. Without development, what will happen to you? So there it is okay. You have to develop yourself even with ego and self-concentration on yourself. But if you concentrate only on yourself, you are going to clash with others. Your neighbor will start shouting Okay, that you are playing music at 12 o'clock at night. So society has to step in. Okay. Society makes laws social laws okay you can't do certain things you can't block uh, your uh, namaz if you want to do you go and uh, block the road for uh, your uh, namaz and no traffic can flow that's not allowed society comes in all practical things you can't cross a direct light okay <laughs> traffic light that's a social law all these things don't steal you can't disturb your neighbors. These are all social laws. But there is the third one is the moral law. And the fourth one is the spiritual law. He has a whole chapter on that, so we won't go into that now. But this is here he is mentioning three laws. He is mentioning actually two laws. The social law and the moral law. You can see the gradation. Na? First, you, are, you have the right to develop yourself with ego. That's perfectly all right, depending at which level you are. But then society steps in and you have to also listen to society. That's the duty is coming. Then you have the moral law. The social laws are not adequate for you. You have the right to apply your moral laws. Then finally, spiritual law, no duties, no compulsions at all. You are completely in the hands of the devil. That completes this. But Rangada, yes, tell me. Moral law is also social law, no? In one sense, on okay. what do you, moral laws base? Okay, I'll tell you. It's on the difference that. between social law and moral law is this. Sirendra makes it very clear. The social law, society is making the laws collectively and imposing them on the individual. That's very clear. All the individuals have to obey the social law. If you don't, then you are a social outcast. But the moral law is not originating from society. It is originating from the developed human being. So Sremdo says, social law is created by society and imposed on the individual. The moral law is developed by the individual who is at a higher level of consciousness relatively. And he thinks that this should be the law and he imposes that on the rest of his thing. So the difference between social law is a very subtle point, but there is a difference. There is a mixture, of course. But the social law, society is imposing itself on the individual. In the moral law, the individual with his ideas, which are necessarily limited, is imposing him, not only really imposing, he convinces everybody that this is what you should do. So moral law is individually originated. It originates in the individual and it becomes a, a social law. That's the difference between the two. Well, let me... Yeah, I was also no, going but Rangada. Huh. at the same time. <laughs> no, I say this, this no, way. this. I, I, Tell me. No, no. Yeah, I can hear. I can hear. Tell me. I said I also got the same question at the same time, and you explained it so well. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't no, explain it. It's no. to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but Rangada, the social huh. law also starts with one individual only. No, the society as a Group doesn't start a law. It, it no, starts no. with one person and then the society agrees to it and becomes a social law. Hello, now listen to me. Okay. When an individual, okay, I'll give you a very easy example. Okay, when an individual 
डिस्टर्ब सोसाइटी विच इज एक्टिविटीज ओके ये आई हैव टोल्ड यू आई गिव वेरी इजी एग्जांपल आई वांट टू प्ले प्ले माय लाउड स्पीकर म्यूजिक एट 12:00 एट नाइट ऑल माय लेबर्स विल बी डिस्टर्ब सो ऑल द नेबर्स विल प्रोटेस्ट सो इट इज सोसाइटी दैट मेक्स अ लॉ दैट इंडिविजुअल कांट डिस्टर्ब द अदर्स सो इट इज ऑलवेज सोसाइटी व्हिच मेक्स सोशल लॉज नॉट द इंडिविजुअल इट्स अ कलेक्टिव थिंग Okay. okay. In fact, that is that that arrangement is that parliament, okay, is the one that makes all the social laws collectively. When parliament passes a a law that this is the rules that we will follow in society, sometimes it may not make sense. So the Supreme Court comes in and says, "Wrong. You have to cancel this law. Or if it is okay, then it is it has to be consistent with the constitution." So. pallu society is imposing the social law okay that is very clear is a collectively they say you can't do this an individual can't do this he can't steal he can't murder so there are laws which prevent these things okay and the laws are that not... those are also moral laws no you can't steal you can't murder you can't there is, there is an there is an interlinking between social law and moral law but essentially there is a difference i am not saying this i am not saying <laughs> if you read the chapter you will see that okay so there is a difference okay so okay shall we go to the next one there are in the world so what if you has to read i will read rangana okay go ahead there are in the world in fact two different laws of conduct each valid on its own plane the rule principally dependent on external status and the rule independent of status and entirely dependent on the thought and conscience the gita does not teach us to subordinate the higher plane to the lower it does not ask the awakened moral consciousness to slay itself on the altar of duty as a sacrifice and victim to the law of the social status it calls us higher and not lower from the conflict of the two planes it bids us ascend to a supreme poise above the mainly practical above the purely ethical to the brahmic consciousness it replaces the conception of social duty by a divine obligation the subjection to external law gives place to a certain principle of inner self determination of action proceeding by the soul's freedom from the tangled law of works and this as we shall see the brahmic consciousness the soul's freedom from works and the determination of works in the nature by the lord within and above us is the kernel of the gita's teaching with regard to action so the chapter heading is the core of the teaching so now he is giving you the core of the teaching and that is the last four lines we read that and this as we shall see the brahmic consciousness the brahmic consciousness is nothing but the self the witness consciousness okay the soul's freedom from works okay the works are what your body mind life is doing but your soul becomes free from the body mind life so it is not obliged to do any work which is related which you think you have to do from your body mind life when your identification body mind life ceases you are free and the determination of works in the nature by the lord within and above us is the kernel of the gita's teaching with regard to action in other words neither individual law which is ego neither social law which is uh, duty bound nor even moral law which is slightly higher than social law but totally free of all laws sarva dharman parityajya maam ekam charanam bhaye no law at all in fact a spiritual man can with impunity break all laws there will be no problem at all for him if he is protected by the divine nothing will happen to him okay so this is the gradation of the four standards of conduct first the egoistic which has not mentioned here and the second is the social law that the, where duty comes in 
So very often, Shraddha, why is it discussing duty? Because there are many people who interpret the Bhagavad Gita as a duty. Okay, it is Arjuna's duty to do what he is asked to do. So Shraddha is contradicting that. He is saying it is not the necessarily the duty of the Kshatriya to kill others. If the demand tells you not to kill, you will not kill. If the demand tells you to go ahead and kill, and even if you don't want to, you are bound by the divine command. That's what Shraddha is explaining. So in other words, the Gita is telling you, identify yourself consciously, not with the body, mind, life, but with the divine guidance. That is the kernel of the Gita's teaching. That's all. Go beyond all laws and identify yourself and become an obedient follower of the divine. I didn't use the word slave because it has got a, um, a negative connotation. But to be the slave of the divine is the happiest condition you can be in. <laughs> okay. In fact, Sri Ramadha says in the, uh, in the uh, record of yoga, he says that we have to combine the two. We have to have dasyam. You have to be a das. You have to be the divine's servant. At the same time, you have to be master of your own nature. Aishwaryam. You have to have, you must be Ishwara of your thing which is below and you have to be a slave to that which is above you. So that's a combination. Interesting combination. Na? You have to be a servant to the divine who is above you and you have to be the master of your own nature. This reminds me of a very interesting thing which Ravindu says. He says, okay, a person who is at an average level of consciousness, okay, uh, he, when he is dealing with people who are inferior to him, he should apply kindness and understanding. Okay? But when you are dealing with someone superior to you, okay, you have to show your personality. You don't need to be a slave to those who are superior to in society. So that's an interesting thing, what he says. There you are. So we go to the next one. So this is very clear now. He's saying when you are in the spiritual consciousness, no question of duty, no question of compulsion. You are completely free to do what the divine is telling you to do. But you must be very clear. It's not your mind that is telling you. It's your, the soul that is telling you what is not and what is not. Okay, you can raise a question, but I'm not aware of my soul. When you are not aware of your soul, you are under the identification with body, mind, life. You are not in a spiritual consciousness. The rule applies only when you are in a spiritual consciousness. That's not easy. Okay. So, shall we go to the next one? We have 20 minutes. The Gita can only be understood. Go ahead. The Gita can only be understood like any other great world of kind by studying in its entirety and as a developing argument. But the modern interpreters, starting from the great writer Bankim Chandra Chaturji, who first gave to the Gita this new sense of the gospel of duty, have laid an almost exclusive stress on the first three or four chapters, and in those on the idea of equality on the expression kartavyam karma, the work that is to be done, which they rendered by duty and all the praise. Thou hast right to action, but none of, none of the proofs of it, which is now popular quoted as the great word. Mahakavya of the Gita. The rest of the 18 chapters with their high philosophy are given a secondary importance, except indeed a great vision in the 11th. This is natural enough for the Indian mod modern mind, for the modern mind which is or has been till yesterday inclined to be impatient of uh, metaphysical subtitles and power of spiritual seekings, eager to get word, and like Arjuna himself, mainly concerned for a workable law of works, dharma. But it is the wrong way to handle this scripture. This is very clear. If you lay stress only on one or two sentences or even one chapter, you are going to get into trouble because you have to see the whole. This is true of everything. Na? 
So you have to see the whole. That's what he said. And he is talking. Who gave the idea of um, Kartavyam Karma? Bankim Chandra Chatterjee. Okay. Now, there's something very interesting about Bankim Chandra Chatterjee, which I want to tell you, okay, because it's very interesting. And I used to also wonder about it. It's, it's a very interesting thing. Now, tell me, who is a Rishi? A Rishi is one who has got spiritual sight. Okay? Spiritual sight means he is able to see subtle things. He is a Rishi. Okay? Now, Sriyavindu calls Bhuktim Chandra. He is a? Uh, uh, he is a? No, I didn't follow. Rishi. Rishi. Okay, okay. Rishi. Okay. So, I couldn't catch the word Rishi. Okay, okay. okay. Rishi. Okay. Normally, we think of a Rishi as a sage, okay? one who is a great spiritual person. But Srivindu is giving a slightly different interpretation. A Rishi is one who can see. Okay? He has mm. got sight. Now, I could not understand because, you know, Pranabda had a, an uncle. Okay? Uh, his name was Charupada Bhattacharya. Bhattacharya. And Charupada Bhattacharya is the one who brought everybody from Mushidabad, uh, the whole family, to Pondicherry. He was responsible for bringing everybody. And he used to be in charge of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, the reception service for a long time. But you know, he was a, outwardly, he was a pretty crude man. I won't go into details, but <laughs> he was very crude in his ways and his speech. Okay? So, when Nolida said that Charupadu, is a Rishi. Okay? I was really quite, I couldn't understand what the hell he is talking about. How can he be a Rishi? He is so crude. But you must remember one thing, the outer nature is one thing and the inner nature is something totally different. So we should never judge somebody by their outer actions. So I couldn't understand this. Now Srivanda is calling Bonkim Chandra Chatterjee as a Rishi, Srivanda is saying Bankim Chandra is a Rishi because he is the one who gave the mantra of Bande Mataram to nation. And after 75, 80 years, or maybe 100 years now, he, Bande Mataram is going to become the catch word in India. Okay, slowly it is coming. Even our national anthem should change over from Janaganamana to Bande Mataram. In fact, now many places they are singing Bande Mataram. Slowly the change may come, I hope. Now, he called Bankim Chandra Chatterjee Rishi. Now, yes. what happened very interestingly, when Bankim Chandra Chatterjee went to see Ramakrishna, okay, Ramakrishna had a conversation with him and he found that Bankim Chandra Chatterjee is only talking about wine, women and uh, wealth and all. So, <laughs> Ramakrishna was disgusted and he said, what sort of a man is this? Okay, So, he is absolutely... Um, Plunge into all this nonsense. Okay. Now look, that's the interesting part. Here is Ram Krishna calling this fellow, Bhankim Chatterjee, a very ordinary man. And Srivanda is calling him a Rishi. Okay. So one day what happened, okay, I was still in the process because I didn't know what is it. I'll tell you something interesting. Temi Ben was a Parsi lady who used to live in Golkon, and she used to be a um, she used to be our uh, poetry teacher in English. Okay? She was a very good teacher. And she used to teach us poetry. And towards the end of her life, I used to meet her every Saturday. And we used to have tea together in the in uh, Balkan. Okay? And she told me something interesting about herself. She said that one day I was in a, a special condition of consciousness. Okay? And I could feel the Agni coming out of my head. Okay, she said that. And she said that when I walked into the tea room of the Golkon, Charupada who was sitting there, he told me, Oh, Temi, you are looking like a yogini. Now when, she, that means in other words, he was able to see that. Okay, so when I heard this, I understood what is Rishi. So your outer nature may be anything. But if you can see certain truths, you can see the future, you can give some, uh, like Bank Bankim Chandra gave Bande Mataram. In fact, Bande Mataram, I'll tell you, is a mixture of Bengali and Sanskrit. And so at that time when he wrote it, there were a lot of criticism. 
and what is this nonsense? It's neither Bengali nor Sanskrit. What the hell? Okay, <laughs> because one day matter is pure Sanskrit. Then to me vidya, to me dharma, to me riti, to me marmo. All this is Bengali. Pakka Bengali. So he said, you fellows won't understand. When he was criticized, Bankim said, you fellows won't understand. But this song will be sung all over India one day. Okay, <laughs> said that. So he had the vision. That is what a Rishi is. <laughs> I'm mentioning all this because Bankim Chandra Chatterjee is being mentioned here. And yet you can see that he misinterpreted the Kartavyam Karma. My point is that outwardly you may be anything, but inwardly you may be something quite different. So the moral is never judge anybody externally. <laughs> okay, it's an interesting uh, thing. I go into all these small incidents because it can enlarge your way of looking at things. Okay. So, now I come back to the. Uh, we got ten minutes. I come back to the paragraph that we have just read. The Gita can only be understood like any other great work of the kind by studying it in its entirety and as a developing argument. But in the modern, in, but the modern interpreters, starting from the great writer Bhankim Chandra Chatterjee, who first gave to the Gita this new sense of a, a gospel of duty, have laid an almost exclusive stress on the first three or four chapters, and in those on the idea of equality, on the expression kartavyam karma. Karma is action, and kartavyam that means you should do. So action which you should do. Obviously, is duty, the work that is to be done, which they render by duty. And on the phrase, "Thou hast a right to action," thou has a right to action, but none to the fruits of action. Karma niyava adhikara se ma phalishu padachan. So you have the right to action. So that's being misinterpreted as duty, okay? which is now popularly quoted as a great word, Mahavakya of the Gita. The rest of the 18 chapters, with their high philosophy, are given a secondary importance, except indeed the great vision in the 11th. The 11th chapter in the Gita is the one where Arjuna is made to see the uh, the divine in his universal aspect and as a destroyer. He has to see the destroyer because then he knows that that also is part of the divine action. So he is given the divya chakshu and he is asked to see. The reality of the universe and the divine action in the physical world. Okay, so that is the eleventh chapter. This is natural enough for the modern mind, which is or has been till yesterday inclined to be impatient of metaphysical subtleties and far off spiritual seekings, eager to get a, to work, and like Arjuna himself. Mainly concerned for a workable law of works, a dharma, but it is the wrong way to handle the scripture. In other words, don't be stuck at the social law or even the moral law, and then the concept of duty and dharma applies. Okay, but that is not the way to read the Gita. You have to go understand beyond that. So now we have got seven eight minutes. I think we have got. About seven eight minutes, we can read the next one. Na? The equality which the Gita preaches. So, next one, who is going to read? Tarika, read? ready to? Yeah, Tarika, go ahead. Your picture is framed in a blue frame, so you are about to speak. Go ahead. Huh? Pardon, I didn't understand. Sorry. No, I said that I can see that your picture on the screen huh. is being <laughs> there's a blue mark coming all around you. So you are ready to read. Go ahead. No, I read already the Rangada. I I read the first paragraph. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. I just read the first paragraph. Okay. I can read again if you want. But <laughs> <laughs> no, no, my mistake. Okay, I hmm. can't, I'm not a Rishi. I can't shall I? <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> Well, do you read? Yeah, read. Okay. 
The equality which the Gita preaches is not disinterestedness. The great command to Arjuna, given after the foundation and main structure of the teaching, have been laid and built. Arise, slay thy enemies, enjoy a prosperous kingdom. Has not the ring of an uncompromising altruism or of a white, dispassionate abnegation? It is a state of inner poise and wideness which is the foundation of spiritual freedom. With that poise, in that freedom, we have to do the work that is to be done. A phrase, a phrase which the Gita uses with the greatest wideness, including in it all works, Sarva Karmani, and which far exceeds, though it may include social duties or ethical obligations. What is the work to be done is not to be determined by the individual choice, nor is the right to action and the rejection of claim to the fruit the great word of the Gita, but only a preliminary word governing the first state of the disciple when he begins ascending the hill of yoga. It is practically superseded at a subsequent stage. For the Gita goes on to affirm emphatically that the, may, the, that the man is not the doer of the action. It is prakriti. It is nature. It is the great force with its three modes of action that works through him. And he must learn to see that it is not he who does the work. Therefore, the right to action is an idea which is only valid so long as we are still under the illusion of being the doer. It must necessarily disappear from the mind like the claim to the fruit as soon as we cease to be to our own consciousness the doer of our works. All pragmatic egoism, whether of the claim to fruits or of the right to action, is then at the end, at an end. At an end, yeah. So, this is a very interesting para, but I don't think we have the time to discuss this in detail. But he's telling you the main difference between the spiritual condition and the moral condition. When you are identified with your body, mind, life, you may be at the individualistic level, or you may be at the social level, or you may be in even a moral level. But you are identified with your body, mind, life, and you think that you are doing everything. The idea of I am the doer is there. That's a sign that you are in ignorance. But the moment your consciousness climbs to the higher mind, above the normal mind, you realize that you are not the doer, you are only the witness, you are only the absolute watcher. And the body-mind life is being subject to the buffetings. Okay, You are being buffeted by and whipped. <laughs> so no, use the word even whipped and ridden like a like a horse. You are a slave to nature. Universal nature is making the tree to grow and the tree does not think that it is growing. It is universal nature that is making it grow. Similarly, universal nature also is making your body mind life act in action, in emotion and in thought. But you think that you are having the thoughts, you are having the, this concept disappears entirely when you realize that you are not the doer. In fact, when you your consciousness goes to the self, that's one of the big realizations that you are not the doer. So if you are not the doer, the question of right to action disappears. Karmanyavadikara say you have the right to action. Concept is valid only when you are identified with your body, mind, life and in ignorance. That's basically what he's saying. So we'll stop here today and maybe we'll do this again next time. We'll reread it and do each sentence. But he's just carrying on the whole concept again very clearly. Okay. So, au revoir, everybody. Merci. Merci.